Has anyone ever told you to follow your passion and you'll build a great life, you'll build a great career? Well, I'm glad you're here then because that is terrible advice. It is advice that I gave to others, it is advice that I took, and it is advice that I lived by for the first half of my career. In today's video, I'm gonna share with you why follow your passion is horrible advice and what we can do instead to build careers that are meaningful and engaging and super rewarding. Hello and welcome back to the Making Hope Happen series. I'm Lori Mage. This is day 95 in the 100 day challenge and we got a lot to cover today so we're going to jump right in. First up, quick little backstory here. Follow your passion is what I tried to do for the first half of my career, all through my 20s, all through my 30s. When I'd ask family members and friends for career advice, they'd all say the same thing. Do what makes you happy, Lori. Do what you love, Lori. I even gave the passion, happiness, do what you love advice to others. And it wasn't until I read Cal Newport's great book, Be So Good They Can Ignore You a few years ago, that I realized just how bad that advice was and why I felt so lousy about myself and my career for the first 20 years or so. The entire book is dedicated to helping readers take a more realistic path in building meaningful and engaging careers. The question that drove the book, the question that Cal was trying to answer was, how do people end up loving what they do? Just to be clear, Cal's not against doing work that you love. He just wants to know, how do you end up there? and come to find out, follow your passion doesn't make the cut. As a matter of fact, people who follow that advice often end up not enjoying their careers. So why is follow your passion bad advice? From Cal's perspective, the idea to follow your passion falsely assumes two things. One, you have a pre-existing passion to follow, like you discover it, you find it, and then you just follow it. That's the first assumption. Two, if you match this passion that you find, to your job, then you're gonna enjoy that job. And that's just not the case. Most people don't have a pre-existing passion. And if they do, passions are really difficult to prioritize. Maybe you're super excited about two or three things equally, then what? Also, passion and interest tend to change over time. The things I'm interested in today at 47 versus what I was interested in at 27 and 17 are just not the same. And what if you're not good at your passion? Who's gonna hire you? That can't be a good career. And another important painful lesson that I learned by following this advice to follow your passion is that that advice, follow your passion, it creates a mindset that is me-centered. It's a me-centered view of the world. And the research is also unequivocal here too. Two important points to make about this me-centered view of doing work. One, work is work. Work takes effort. Developing our skills can be mentally and emotionally exhausting and sometimes physically painful. If we're constantly going throughout the day asking ourselves every single day, am I enjoying this or not? You're going to be miserable because a lot of times you're not enjoying it. Having a meaningful and rewarding career doesn't mean you're going to enjoy every single second of the day or that it's going to be easy and it's going to be blissful. With that kind of me-centered approach to work, anytime something's not going perfectly or blissfully, we start to question if this is the work for me or not. Oh, I've lost my passion. Which is confusing and painful and not helpful to building a long-term career that actually does make you happy. And number two, the research on workplace satisfaction tells us people like their jobs for more nuanced reasons than simply matching their innate interests and passions to a job that needs to be done. What's fascinating about this second point is that the research that Cal is referring to comes from more than four decades of studies that have been conducted on workplace satisfaction and motivation. It's not something that was just recently discovered. We've known what makes people happy in their careers for decades. Now, I was lucky enough to come across this research eight or nine years ago when I started teaching and coaching inside of an organization on how to create the conditions for internal motivation versus external motivation. The research is called self-determination theory or SDT. And the research has identified that all humans across the globe, regardless of where you live or what kind of work you do, we all have three basic psychological needs that we bring to the workplace. Now, these are needs, they're not just like a nice to have. If the conditions in your work environment keep you from being able to satisfy these three psychological needs, you will be unhappy, you will be disengaged in your work. As I share these three psychological needs that we bring to the workplace, be reflecting on jobs that you have absolutely loved and also jobs that you have absolutely hated. 
And I guarantee when you reflect on that, the jobs that you actually loved that you've done before helped you satisfy these three psychological needs. And the jobs that you hated, maybe the job you're in right now, is stifling one or all of these needs. So what are these three psychological needs that trump passion when it comes to building careers that we love? First, competence. Competence is the feeling you get when you're really, really good at what you do. It's a feeling you get when other people value your experience and your expertise. They ask you for your opinion. They ask you for your input. People who don't feel competent in their work don't enjoy their work. Surprise! This all makes me think of like golfing, the sport of golfing. Like if you go out and you're terrible at golfing, more than likely you're not gonna wanna continue to do it. But if you're kinda good, you're like, ah, oh, I could get good at this. You get that one sweet shot, then you're back. Like you're hungry to get competent at it. But if you have no skill set whatsoever, you're gonna avoid it at all costs. Nobody likes to do things that they suck at. Competence also has to do with flow states. So our need for competence is not just about feeling like we're good at our work. If we aren't feeling slightly challenged by our work, we're gonna get bored. Competence is feeling good at what we do. And it's also about using our mastery to solve problems and to continue to grow and learn. That's competence. The second psychological need we bring to the workplace is relatedness. Now, the psychological need for relatedness, this is our innate desire to belong, to feel like we're part of a tribe, to feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. It has to do with our relationships, the relationship we have with ourselves, the relationship we have with our work, the relationship we have with those we work with, and the relationship we have with the people that our work benefits. Relatedness is all about people and purpose. And last up, the third psychological need that we all bring to the workplace is autonomy. Autonomy, this is about having a sense of freedom and choice. People who are happy in their careers feel like they have a certain degree of control over their work, how they spend their time, what they work on, and who they choose to work with. Autonomy is huge. And Kel argues that the ones who have created the most autonomy in their careers have focused on developing skills and knowledge that are both rare and needed in the world. He calls this career capital. When you are really great at what you do, competence, and lots of people need what you have, which fills your bucket for relatedness and gives us a sense of purpose, you will have freedom to live and work where you want and who you want to work with autonomy. When we have freedom, mastery, and purpose, passion tends to ensue. So competence, relatedness, and autonomy. Did you do that example? Did you reflect on your jobs that you've had before? The jobs you felt most satisfied with and the jobs that you absolutely dreaded going to? My hunch is you've got some insights about those needs either being met or those needs being stifled. Now it's practical tip time. If we really want to build rewarding, meaningful, and engaging careers, don't follow your passion. Instead, Cal encourages us to focus on developing skills and knowledge that are both rare and valuable and adopt a craftsman mindset versus that me-centered passion mindset and then get to work getting so good that they can't adore you. I speak from experience here when I say the process will not be easy. I guarantee it. But Cal says no one owes you a great career. You have to earn it. So that's it for day 95 in the Making Hope Happen series. Don't follow your passion. Build great skills and knowledge that are rare and valuable. Look for ways to be of service to others, to belong to a tribe, to do something beyond yourself. Adopt that craftsman mindset and get so good that they can't ignore you so you can create that sense of freedom and choice in your career and let the passion ensue. If you got value today, give me a thumbs up. If you're feeling it, leave a comment below. It would really mean the world to me. And if you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button and be sure to hit the notifications so you know when the next video drops. And lastly, if you know someone who you think would benefit from today's message, please share it with them. I'm on a mission to help build a happier, healthier, more loving world. And in the right hands, I know these videos can help. I just need your help finding those right hands. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks for commenting, sharing, and subscribing. Much love. Have an awesome night, and I'll see you tomorrow.